Hello, this welcome to the ninth online symposium from AIU Atlantic International University. My name is Dr. Edward Lambert hosting this event, and we have the theme of my legacy to future generations. We are now going to move to our next presenter, Dr. Carol Tillman, who is now becoming available to talk. Dr. Tillman, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay, we have a little echo in your, in your sound. There. Hi. Hi, maybe what I need to do is, I'm gonna mute my microphone and see if there's still an echo. I don't know. Is there an echo for me? Yeah, there's an echo. It's okay. We can still oh. understand what you're saying. Are you, are you on the screen showing? I am on the screen. I would like to put my presentation up. Go ahead and share your screen. Hey, there we go. There it goes. There it goes. It worked. How, how are you today, by the way? I'm quite well. I'm actually sitting in an apartment in New York City. As you can see behind me, I am returning to Israel later this evening. Uh, the semester starts in two weeks. So I have to go back and prepare some lesson plans and see my family. So there you have it. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and start talking. I was, I, I was very interested in, the, in one of the previous speakers who commented on teaching on Zoom. Um, I believe she's in Jordan now. She's Egyptian, she's in Jordan now. But we also taught last year on Zoom. And I teach the college, college level, more college level than I do younger children at the moment. And it was an experience. There were internet outages, there were videos, yes, and voice no, but somehow we managed to get through the entire semester. And it was fascinating. It was a lot of learning, a lot of coordinating amongst teachers and students in, um, as to how to present the material and then also to get the final exams. Um, it, was, it was fascinating. It really was, and I'll just leave it at fascinating. Um, okay, creating a legacy for teaching. Yes, I teach. Um, I enjoy teaching. I've been teaching probably close to 40 years. Um, there's always ups and downs in teaching, and you always want to, no, I missed too many. You always want to do the best you possibly can. So I'm going to start with my own childhood and what I saw from my parents and my family as far as educating and creating a legacy. When I was growing up, I saw that every time my father sat down, it was with a book in one hand and a cup of coffee on the table next to a cigarette. Let's forget the cigarette because uh, I don't smoke and nobody else in the family did. But he always had a book and he had a cup of coffee and he crossed his legs and he sat down and he read a book. That was that spry for, from a lot of my father's years when I was a child. If he had a chance to take a nap on the weekends in between work and whatever, and I was sent to wake him, he'd have a book open like this and his glasses on, okay? Why is this, why is this, why did this make an impression upon me? I was a child growing up and we always learn from our surroundings. This is part of our legacy. My dad was always with books. My brother was always reading. And it made me think maybe this is a good thing. So I started reading and I continued reading and then I picked up music uh, later in my life. All right, but that's a different point. Talking about the history of reading and how it's important. I was doing my usual thing in fourth grade. What does that mean? I had a textbook and inside the textbook was a library book. That's how I went through elementary school, except one teacher was not so happy about me reading so much. 
my what I wanted and wanted me to pay attention to what she wanted. She walked around the classroom, took the library book, closed it, and left it on my desk. Fine. Uh, what happened after that? What happened after that? I went back to reading the book. Why is this not going up? It should go on the next slide. Oh, wait, maybe it's over here. There it is. Okay, why is this important? She came back because I continued to read. Not only did she close the book, she took it to her desk. And I had to go up after school and explain to her, I'm reading. She says, pay attention in class, read at home. Okay. My feeling is, well, you know, the trials and, and, and tribulations of trying to read whenever I want, but I can't do it, obviously, in school. All of this just shows that not only my father's generation taught us to read, but I read. My siblings read. We had bookshelves, libraries of books in the house. I think one particular summer I walked up to our library and read almost everything in that branch library, except for science fiction. I'm not so crazy about science fiction, but my brother was, all right? Talking about family and legacy, what am I leaving my children? As a child, we didn't watch so much television at home, all right? We watched music events, that was about it, concerts, I can remember listening to concerts from New York City on the, on the TV, on the radio. Wonderful. My children also never watched so much TV. There were sports. There was reading books. I introduced them to reading. I used to sit and read to them at night. One of their favorite books years ago was Good Night Moon. It's just about a child going to sleep at night and saying good night to the moon, good night to the flowers, good night to the stars, and everything else around the child. Um, my children, in turn, have grown up, gotten married. The grandchildren now have books of their own. And on the occasions when they come to visit, I have enough children's books that the beds are covered with the books. And sometimes you can't even find the child for the number of books that are covering the bed. The legacy goes on. Reading, education. I even wrote a book about my grandchildren um, because it's part of the legacy. What did we do? When I think of my legacy, I continue to think of education. I've had the honor and privilege of teaching many students both college level, elementary school level, as well as adults from various parts of the world, including Peru, Argentina, Brazil, Holland, England, France, Germany, Kenya, and America. I live in Israel. It's an international country. There are people from all over the world not only come to visit, but also to work and then they need English, they need education. They do need education in English. I've had a wonderful time teaching them. Yes, it's sometimes difficult comprehension, but we do it. Um, I've, been, I've been teaching children from and adults from around the world for over 30 years. And I've been teaching them both in English as a second language, and also music. Um, with your permission, I will start with my legacy in teaching music to children. These are all like little stories. Did I miss? No, I didn't. I didn't just. Um, I grew up in a household full of music. We were very fortunate. My parents learned music. We were all involved, both my siblings and myself were involved in musical groups, in performing. We were very, very, very fortunate. Um, our parents taught us that diligence, the work, and the hard work of preparing for concerts is 
recitals and contests, contests were always worthwhile. Um, I continued with my musical career until I married and had a family and then put it aside to raise our children. As our children grew older, they were introduced into the world of music lessons, regular practice, rehearsals, and concerts. Again, very fortunate that this is something our parents loved within their house from their parents, my grandparents, to my parents, to our generation, to my children. Um, there were very instruments, including drums, musicals, which was song and dance, and local folk dancing groups. They enjoyed it, they enjoyed and learned to appreciate the music, and that continued on in the next generation. Again, continuing the legacy of music and how to appreciate it and how to learn it. Okay, that next generation are actually my grandchildren. We have keyboards, we have recorders, we have mandolins, we have violins, a whole collection that comes and goes. Um, and they love it. And they play for me, they play for their friends, they play for their school programs. It's another generation. The legacy goes on. One of my oldest grandchildren has recently married and took her instruments into her home. The ones that she had played and learned how to play so that her daughter will eventually learn music. She already loves to dance, sing, and it's wonderful. Slide three. Wait, I need to change slides. No, 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 no. Oh, where did it go? Introduction. How does this go down? I'm sorry, I want to change. Ah, oh, there it is. A music legacy. Now, being an English teacher as well as a music teacher gives me, I don't know, two different, thing, two, two different things to do in my life. My love of music is in my soul. English is what I do every day, but my music is with me all the time. It's something I pass on to my students and for one particular student who I taught for four years, moved to another country with her family. They tried to find another piano teacher to this student. Very difficult. Why? I'm not sure. All I do is teach, but I put energy, fun, work, laughter, history into the lessons so that not only will the student remember what they've learned musically, but they will remember they had a great teacher and hopefully pass it on to more students as they become teachers. This particular student also sang. Since they could not find a piano teacher to suit their needs, i.e. someone to, that was similar to my teaching, she went back to singing in a choir, okay? No more piano lessons. But in addition to that, I've also been able to travel and visit some of my former students and see how they've improved, see what they're doing. Um, the legacy just keeps in music in this instance. I have another student who played an instrument and wanted to join a national group, orchestra. She worked and worked and worked, extremely intelligent, extremely diligent. But rhythm and playing in rhythm was not the easiest thing for her. We worked and we worked, and she was finally accepted as the, she played clarinet and still plays clarinet, but they took 18 clarinet students for this orchestra, a very big student international in Europe. She was accepted as the 18th student. 
busy. She worked on the music and went to the festival. They re-auditioned the clarinet students. She did so well at the second auditions that she moved up seven chairs. She became a second clarinetist. What does this show? It just shows how much she wanted it, how much she learned, her hard work. She continued to play. Her children now play music. It's a legacy that goes on. This particular student was from Holland. She has a degree in engineering. And she lives in America. So she's all over the world. The music is all over the world. It's a wonderful thing. Another student who has continued on, not only in music, but also in dance. Very diligent. She advanced in her learning very rapidly because she wanted to achieve and she loved music. From high school, she moved away from, from home which I thought would be the end of her music lessons. Not so much. Her parents arranged for me to go to her boarding school once a week, and I would give her a lesson. And on the weekends she would come home, I would go to their house and teach. So there was no end to it. The music came and continued and continued. All right? She auditioned again for a music grade in her last year of high school and received a grade of 97. Quite good. Today, what does this person do to continue the legacy of music education and education in general? She is in charge, she's a band director in charge of a citywide music program. I've heard the bands that she teaches with they are amazing. Her work is unbelievable. And watching her teach another generation to appreciate music is just a lot of music and a lot of education going on through another generation and in another generation. Teaching students uh, um, in any educational system always has additional and unusual students. I taught students with disabilities, both in English and in music. In music, I taught her piano. The girl has cerebral palsy. She can walk okay. Her left hand plays piano beautifully. Her right hand doesn't play as well. Not all the fingers work the way we want them to. Um, I taught her how to play with the left hand and the fingers she could on the right hand. A lot of research. I'm also in the process of writing up this research and how I did it so that other people can learn from it. She continues to play. She continues to sing. And she enjoys it very, very, very much. We are on Zoom, we are on emails, we are in constant touch. Um, but these are students with challenges. And let me go to this one. It's a lot of fun, it's a big challenge, it's a lot of work, it's a lot of research, but it's a lot of fun because at the end of it, you see what's been accomplished and then go on to continue in their teaching needs or in their musical needs. Students with challenges. We talked about music just now with that particular piano student. Um, and now I would like to go over to teach, to, to talk about teaching English as a second language in college level or at college level. I teach, I teach English as a second language at a sports college, which means these are students who are either professional sports, sports, uh, um, professional sports people, or they are going to become teachers of sport in, in schools. 
any level, all right? The requirement that we have now in our country is that every student at a college level must have a certain proficiency of English. Therefore, all the colleges do teach English at different levels so that when you do graduate, you have a certain proficiency, you are able to communicate, you're able to read, to write, to understand, to do research on a computer in English, and to be able to go into different school systems and teach in English if the need arises. Um, I think I started teaching in universities about 15, almost 15 years ago. And I switched from one university to a different college. So now I'm in this sports college. And teaching English as a second language is an experience unto itself. It comes with great knowledge or it comes with very little knowledge. Um, I have taught all the different levels. I consider myself able to do this from students who barely know the alphabet to students, students who are almost completely fluent in English as a second language, not as a first language. It's fascinating, it's challenging. Uh, sometimes it's also frustrating as I will talk about later. Um, along with teaching English, you also have in colleges students um, with disabilities, okay? Mostly physical disabilities at this point. Um, so when you're on campus, you have students who are in wheelchairs, you have students on crutches, maybe after surgery of some sort, you have students that come with a sling from arm surgery. It's a sports college. They play every sport there is, I think. And as well as these, you also have students with different levels of hearing or sight limitations. You have students who are deaf, who sight read, who uh, lip read rather, okay? Or have uh, hearing aids that help them hear just a little bit. Or you have students with sight limitations. I had one student had this past semester who came with a seeing eye dog the most beautiful, gentle dog ever, would walk in with a student, sit down at his feet. The student had perfect hearing, he listened. His exams were given to him orally, um, and he did quite well. There are other students who, I had one student I had to do individual testing for. Again, he had seeing problems. So I take his exam, I take my exam, we go to a private room, and I start to read to him. He says, you don't have to read the exam to me. I'm like, but I thought that's what I was here for. He says, no, I can see it. I mean, he had glasses, but I have to show you exactly how far the paper was from his face. It was like this, all right? Like maybe two or three inches, less than 10 centimeters away from his face, but he could read it. He read the whole exam, he wrote his own answers, albeit again, the page was on the table and he was doing this, but he wrote. And I gave the exam back to uh, my boss, the department chair. She graded it, showed me he did very well. I'm like, well, I just sat there and watched. Nothing else for me to do. But he did so well. Now, one semester, not so long ago, there were, my, my classes had mixed, mixed levels, mixed students. I had hearing disabilities, seeing disabilities, and one who came on crutches for post-surgery. But not only were these disabilities incorporated into the classes, we were teaching on Zoom. Teaching on Zoom, is that's into something completely different, okay? It's, it's, do you have internet? Why don't you have internet? I do have internet. 
Why is your screen so small? Oh, I'm driving home from work and the Zoom is in front of me. All right? Or walking home and Zoom is in front of me on the phone. Or they're in somebody else's house and they're using their Zoom. Or they're home with their parents and they're using the parents' Zoom. Quite often, the computer would be in the kitchen and there would be people walking behind them, both directions, all right? I finally limited and said to them, go into another room, not in the kitchen, no people, no pajamas, no phones. Let's do this. Yes, it was difficult. My department chair and I, my boss, spent a number of occasions when she was driving home and I was driving someplace on WhatsApp, talking or on the phone in the car. What are we going to do with this? What are we going to do with this? How are we going to solve this problem? How are we going to solve that problem? Because all these students are there not only to get education, but again, to go back to become teachers, which continues the legacy. These, these students will go into the schools and teach. And they will be showing other students how it's done and how it can be done with or without disabilities. They are totally capable of doing this. So that's a tremendous challenge. Um, we, we, we continue to, to talk and brainstorm, get together. Hello, Dr. Tillman? Yes. I think we have a question from Angela Hernandez. Okay. Can we ask, I'm gonna ask her to unmute and see if she has a question. Sure. Angela? Angela Hernandez, do you have a question? Angela? Uh, and... No, I don't have a question, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay. Dr. Tillman, yeah. please, please continue. Thank you. Um, so we did a lot of a lot of brainstorming, a lot of talking, a lot of communication just between the two of us. Um, we finished the semester. Everybody passed except one student who didn't show up for the final exam. Um, but we still have questions um, as to what's well, the best way. Questions were asked. Well, it's on. Yes. Someone has a question? Yeah. I... Go ahead. Unmute. Unmute. I don't hear you. Hello. 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 Yes. Hello. Yes. I hear um, you. I hear you. Oh. Yeah. Hello. You can hear me now. Yes. Okay, my my name is Alpha Kanu from Sierra Leone, West Africa. Um, the question that I want to ask is, I want my legacy to be successful and acceptable by, by all, but how can I do it with my limited resources? I mean, I'm in a state where there is no one around to back me up, no facility to move on, you know, so uh, I'm afraid. Get creative in how you present the material. Okay. It can be it can be on a blackboard. Okay. It can be on a wall that you can erase. It can be drawings. It can be descriptions. It can be explanations. Get get creative. Okay. All right. And I can I don't know if I can do this or not, but I'm more than willing to give you my email. If somebody, if you if you want me to see if I can help you figure something out, I have no problem with that. Yeah, so um, let me have let me have your email, please. How do I do that on here? See? How do I how do I do that? Can I do that? Click to add notes. Wait a minute. Yeah, chat notes. Yeah. Oh yeah, I have to find chat. I'll, uh, chat. Wait, 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 wait. Here. Type a message. Here, I'm sending it. C A R O L M T three at email.com. Enter. 
There's my email. If you have, if, if I, I have no problem brainstorming and seeing how I can help. Harding, you also have a question, I see. Yes, yes. Yeah, hello? Hello, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, doctor, I was, I, I was just following your presentation. Um, it's, I'm from Sierra Leone, by the way. I'm adding from Sierra Leone. Yeah, your presentation is, um, is quite impactful. It's interesting. In fact, it jogged my thinking. Um, I'm not just asking a question. I want you to guide me whether what I have thought of your presentation, if it's in place or not. I have just thought of um, legacy to start from habits because from what you presented, it's like you, you saw habits uh, coming up, habits being um, uh, demonstrated. You know, some can be demonstrated knowingly and some unknowingly, it can just uh, come out like that. So uh, uh, along that line, I'll, I'll, I see habits and I see the building of a character and I see, um, see it moving towards creating I a don't legacy. See Ramaya. Ramaya. Yeah. Ramaya. Creating oh, legacy. Yeah. So, um, hello, hello. I hear you, Harding. I hear yes. you. Yes. So, I want you, I want, I want you, Doc, to help to assist me in, in differentiating legacy from habits. Like, what will I see somebody, somebody's uh, doing that can, that can be of a better uh, uh, character and of a better legacy that will actually impact me and then that will transcend? Or how to build up habits and character to be able to build up a legacy? So I am in that kind of uh, pool wherein I battle with habits, character, and legacy. So I don't know. I think it's I think it's a combination because I learned from my my father, my parents, habits, good habits yeah. of reading. Yeah. yeah. I continued it. That was my parents' legacy to me. Okay. 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 I went further, became a teacher. Yeah. Um, because my father was, was an engineer and my mother uh, worked part time, okay. Um, mm. but I, I learned from the habits they had by reading. All right, okay. my mother used to read the newspaper, my father would read books. I learned from this that reading is a good thing. I pass it to my children and to my students. I try and make reading easier for them by teaching them the, the basics or what to look for so that reading does become easier for them so that learning becomes easier for them okay okay the legacy yeah. is that these students my legacy is that my students and i consider them my students until they graduate yeah um they are continuing to be a teacher in schools. And hopefully because they love what they're doing and it's not just a job, as we would say. Yeah. They will encourage not all students. All right? Not all students will follow a legacy. We can only hope that some of them do. Okay. Continues another generation, and it goes on and on. The examples I'm giving are from yeah. my personal life. There's no reason why it cannot be anybody's or in any situation that a person who is a teacher continues and shows how much they love it by the effort and the creativity, as we were talking about, goes into what we do. Their habits. Okay. Yeah. I have another. Yeah. Go yeah. Ahead. Yeah. So, really, that that's 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 actually 
uh, composition of um, these three things, the habits, the character that can build up uh, a legacy. From, yes. from, from, from my understanding now as to your presentation, it's like um, you cannot, it's, it's like legacy is not far-fetched from heritage or from someone being inspired by either community as a whole or an individual which you can see as a model, which you can see as a model. So um, um, guide their uh, uh, mo models too can, can bring out a, a, a legacy from you. A legacy. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so you can see the, the various angles that can lead to legacy. Yes. You learn you learning habits from parents, looking yes. at build up characters from individuals that you work with every day in the community, at your workplace, in the society at large. I think that helps to, to mold your legacy. Yes, that helps to that helps to build a legacy out of you that you can hand down to generations coming. I think I think I, I have learned a lot from, from the presentation because from, from just the music thing you're talking about, the reading habits you're talking about, it became something huge so much that um, you, you loved it so much that you wanted people to be like you, to be like you. So, the other angle, the end point of legacy is that um, we should yearn of having people to look onto us in terms of um, either, either taking good things from our character, from our behavior at the workplace and all of that. That could, that could, that could turn out to be a legacy. Yes. yes. So, yeah, I think that's that's my understanding for now. That's good. I like that. I agree. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, are there more questions? I have a little bit more that I'd like to share with you, if possible. Um, yeah, wait a minute. Let me move another. Yeah, Dr. Tillman, go ahead. Please continue with your presentation. I guess we'll save some of the uh, questions for after. Okay. All right. Um, creativity in my life and as a legacy. Uh, what does this mean to be creative? Not only in teaching, but in other things as well. Um, I, I, I'm creative. Okay. I, I enjoy taking things and and, and using my hands. For many years, I was a music teacher. I still am. But you know, you wash your hands. You don't get it broken. It's not this, it's not that. Very few sports. I played basketball. And my mother made me stop when I was 16 because I fell and injured my shoulder. And she was afraid it would hurt my hands. So that was the end of my basketball career. But um, before we moved to Israel, the school, one of the local schools where we lived had adult education classes, not only in reading or writing or math, but also furniture repairing. So I took the furniture repairing course, not knowing where we would be, what we would have, where we'd be able to find things for the family. I took a furniture repairing course. Um, I ultimately, I bought all the tools that I needed for furniture repairing. I bought hammers, I bought nails, I bought things to stretch fabric, a whole collection, and it went with us. Why is this important? Sometimes, at least where, what I've seen in my life, I haven't been all over the world, but I do know I've seen I've seen enough that I know that some, some furniture can be repaired. Some things can be corrected. I would find old furniture on the sides of the road. 
One particular night at 10.30 in the rain, I found a desk. I took it to the light, made sure it was steady, and it was, and I brought it home. Never mind, it almost went out back to the street the next day because my husband was not too happy. But that's a different story. I took off a lid, I took off another lid, I redid the whole table, recovered it in different paper, and it's now sitting by my front door, okay? I have found oversized chairs, circular, that needed fabric, that was torn, the fabric was torn. I rolled it home, it would not fit in a car, and I had no truck to bring it home in. Fortunately, it was about, it wasn't so far to roll it home. Turned it on its side, rolled it down, rolled it in the building, took it up the stairs and recovered it. It went out to somebody's house. When I recover, I repair, it goes. Somebody needs it, it goes. It does not stay in my house. I have found wooden chairs that the paint's been scratched. They're still good. You can still sit on them. I bring them home, repaint them, sometimes odd colors, but that's me. And they've gone out. I've made tables from old wooden picture frames, four legs, and some old wood on the inside, painted it, and it's wonderful. Anybody can use a table like that. It's just that taking old and renewing and then continuing to give it away. It's a hobby, it's things people need, and I enjoy doing it. Is it a legacy? I have, my son actually has a set of tools for, wood, for building in wood. His son, uses more tools than I do, okay? He's seen me, he's wanted to do it. We've done it. Um, one of my daughters is also into fabric. Curtains, bedspreads, clothing, from odds and ends, patchwork quilts. A patchwork quilt left over from fabric. It doesn't have to have a design. You just stitch it together how you think you like it. And it goes. All this I've taught my children. My grandchildren have learned from it. And also have some of those blankets and chairs. But it's just another legacy. Another way of passing on what I have to other people. My neighbors know that I sew and I repair. My other, other people in other communities know that I've done this for my children and they want to know if I can do it for them. Now, along with teaching and giving the tools for learning, I also hope that I've tried to, and let me get to the next slide, give not only a love of learning, but also a love of laughter. Yes. Someone has something, I don't know. Also giving them a love of laughter. Um, I firmly believe in laughing. I think it's good, I, think, I know it's healthy. I don't know who's speaking. And Hopefully I've given the students a desire to learn, given them the strength and the commitment to learn and to pass it on. Because that's basically what a legacy is, you're passing it on. Yes, I have a lot of patience. I do. Patience as in um, the time, okay? Not in a rush. Yes, I will go over material again and again. This is becoming a good teacher and passing it on. Did you have the patience to sit with a first grader and teach them the ABC? Or with a third grader who's, or second grader who's learning multiplication? All right? Or history? Therapy. Um, I believe that parents need to be part of this picture of passing on a legacy. I think it's a combination of teaching, 
with teachers and parents and how it affects the family that it needs to be all that it needs to be worked with. All right. I remember my teachers in elementary school, and I do remember them. They were wonderful teachers. Um, they were kind, they were caring. And if there was an issue we had in class, they were always in touch with the parents. But we, the teachers loved us and took time with us, and we in turn loved our teachers. All my, all my lower grade teachers, my high school teachers, and even some of my college ones, okay? They were good. They took care of us. They worked with us. And I in turn as a student have that, and as a teacher have that. Um, I think I can sum up here, and the last paragraph I had, because I'm reading from what I wrote more or less, I had the distinct pleasure of watching my children grow up, get married, and have their own children. This has given me both pleasure and an opportunity to continue my legacy in many, many different ways. I am both fortunate and very grateful to be able to have done this and to continue to do this. Um, legacy is something that goes on and on. And I see it all the way down my family. I see it with my students. And I try and bring it out in the broader community by helping families from the international community learn English, as well as music, but definitely teaching them English. Um, and that's all I have to say. You have questions? Hello, do we have any questions? We have some uh, hands up. Let's go with uh, Ibrahim Muhammad Koroma. Here, please activate your microphone and let us know your question. Ibrahim Muhammad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good evening, good evening, doctor. You are hearing me? I hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm Ibrahim Mohamed Kuruma calling from Freetown, Sierra Leone. Uh, my background is uh, I'm both a legal person, I'm a lawyer, and uh, also a retired, retired corner. Uh, uh, thank you so much, uh, AIU, for giving us the opportunity to share ideas online. Uh, Dr. Carol Silman and uh, the other speakers have done a very beautiful job by giving us exposes of their ideas and whatever. Some of us have not been able to put down something on paper, but I mean, we just want to share this first experience so that we can have the direction as to where to go. Uh, my own experience was, I mean, during or after our civil war. Incidentally, I had, been, I had just gone to the university to, to read law and I came out just at the war was coming to a close when Fodis and Kwa and others went into a peace deal. I mean, ECHO has played a very great part in that. So uh, we, I was one of the fortunate people that was involved in putting the army back together. You know, we had the rebels, so we have uh, the soldiers, we have over 18,000 personnel and Kamajos and so. And uh, there was no saloon then, law and order was zero. I mean, we had to get these rebels out of the bush. We deconscientized them in their, their concentration camps before they were put together into a trained force. I was involved with IMAT, the British people, to go out to MAPE. Uh, that is the first area they, they placed them to teach them. And uh, it was quite a very big task. I mean, to somebody who has been living in the bush, killing at will, I mean, to tell him what is the rule of law and how to obey civilian government. I mean, it was quite a task. I mean, somebody was asking how, uh, how to go about it. Well, those days we had limited uh, resources. And what the IMAT did was that they provided us with, with flip charts, okay? And then uh, we were, because a lot of the people, the ex-combatants were illiterate, Sometimes we, we, we do not have to speak in English, we speak in the Bible.
We seem to have lost audio from Ibrahim Muhammad. Uh, let's go, let's move on then to Sarah Omet. Okay. Sarah Omet Peregrino. Sarah Omet, if you can activate your microphone. Right, thank you very much. Excellent. Please tell us your question. Yes, um, thank for uh, IAU um, giving us this opportunity for this presentation. Unfortunately, some of us couldn't meet the deadline, but I'm so grateful and I love the presentation. And I congratulated Carol for this presentation. In fact, I happen to be um, an occupational um, in artist and in creative um, and cosmetology. And I really love his presentation. It's take all, all over of her uh, to mobilize this um, uh, creative uh, living a legacy. But uh, my question is, um, is she doing it all alone in terms of resources, um, in terms of mobilization? Because it's, it's not easy in, in, in teaching all these things alone. But I congratulated her because um, indeed he would uh, leave um, a legacy in the community. And the question is, how is she mobilizing um, the people in terms of finances? That's a good question. Um, my, my college education, obviously I'm getting paid through, the government is, is paying for the salaries because it's a college and through the country. It's through the Department yeah. of Education. Yeah. Um, I volunteer to teach English to the international community. I write my own material. I meet with them once a week for about three hours. It's stimulating now. But it's volunteer. When I need. It's volunteer. Yeah. Um, any 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 props that I need, any materials that I need, I the, 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 the money I get is it doesn't cover two pencils. So it comes okay. from me, it comes from me, from my pocket. Um, but I enjoy teaching them, I enjoy helping them understand mm -hmm. and making their okay. lives better so that when they go on, it will make somebody else's life better. When it comes okay. to the furniture, um, which is a very funny story because I have a teddy bear in a chair waiting to be repaired when I get home. Mm -hmm. A girlfriend of mine here had leftover fabric. Okay. I have I have this much, if you can see, fabric going home with me in a suitcase. Okay. Okay. She's cleaning out. She said, take what you want. I took almost everything, so it's donated. Okay, okay. the chairs yeah. I find I find on the street. I have okay. friends who have leftover paint. Okay. I'll go and I'll, I'll say you don't need that color. What are you going to do with that? I take the paint from them. Okay. I take sponges, anything I can find, cloth and brushes sponges, anything to create and use for painting. Okay. If anything I do like that comes from me, comes from my soul, my heart, and my pocket. The only thing I really get paid for is teaching the English as a second language. The rest okay. of it comes from me. And yes, I have couches that are third hand in my house. I have beds that are second hand in my house. I have carpets that are second hand. I have um, some things I've bought, I've bought new, but many things in my house are second hand or bought on sale or wherever I can find them. And I get people to bring them home for me. I say, you need English lessons? I'll give you three English lessons. Bring that to my house tonight. It's a matter of learning how to barter, how to trade, <coughs> excuse me, and 
and, and just being as creative as possible. Mm -hmm. And asking other people, do you have this? Do you have that? So it's, it's, it's a whole combination and, and, and just trying to be as creative as possible. It's difficult, yes. There are days I am frustrated because I cannot find what I want. I cannot use what I found. Okay, but um, but that's but that's that's part of life. That's part of legacy. That's part of moving on and 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 finding something else. Congratulations! It, it's a struggle, but you know it's part of it's part of me. I enjoy it. In our country. One more, and then we can go on to another question. In our question, the men do not wear ties when they wear a suit. They wear a white shirt, dark pants, but no ties. Okay, maybe once or twice in their lives. Friends of mine gave me a shoebox, a rather large box of ties that they weren't using anymore. I opened them up flattened them out, and covered a coffee table in all different colors. I still have to do the legs, but it's just creating. I try and create from what people don't want. And it goes on. My children do this. My children, if they have boxes, or they find boxes on the street from furniture, uh, cartons, cartons. They take them and they make storefronts. They'll make a supermarket with colors right. and crayons and, and, and anything like this is usable. All right, thank you very much. I would like to have your email for any collaboration that we can assist to um, um, help the community to, I mean, indeed leave a legacy. Um, my email is on chat. See if okay. you can see it. Open up chat. Okay. I'll type it again. Okay, okay, we're going to move on. Thank, thank you, Sarah, for that question. We're going to move on to Andrew Hicks. Call MC3. Andrew Hicks, if you can activate your microphone and ask a question or a comment. Thank you very much. Hello. Good. Hello. Are Hello, you hearing Andrew, me? Andrew, I hear you. Are yes, I am. Are you hearing me? Yes. Oh, bless God. Um, first of all, um, I'm Andrew Hicks. I'm from Guyana. And I'm currently enrolled uh, in the PhD program in criminology oh, at PIU. And, move, and move I'm extremely you. appreciative yes. of this opportunity to participate okay. in this symposium. And I must Can say that I'm me? very encouraged mm. And I feel empowered by the presentations. But I want to speak especially to the last presentation from Dr. Tillerman in addressing the issue of creating a legacy. What I take away um, from your presentation is really the importance of the social bond in the learning process. And what I take away, re reflecting on my own readings in sociology and criminology, is that from all that you've shared, I've recognized that essentially, people learn essentially in three ways. And I think this is what a lot of the social process theories about cognitive learning speaks to. Um, they learn by way of instruction, they learn by way of modeling, and they learn by way of sanction. What is unfortunate, uh, Guyana is a South American country, uh, uh, culturally located in the Caribbean, uh, but physically on the South American continent. And we have a history of colonization and I recognize that one of the approaches uh, that is very common in the learning dynamic in this hemisphere 
is the tendency to associate learning with sanctions, but oftentimes those sanctions are punitive. Using forms, for example, using forms of corporal punishment, which to my mind serves as a disincentive to the learner. And so I would like to ask you, what are some, if you accept that learning is essentially uh, enabled through instruction, modeling, and sanction, what, what, what type of enabling sanctions you have used? And in this context, I, I'm really speaking to what kind of incentives you have used in order to bring learners on board as part of your journey in teaching and educating? I think it depends on, I think it depends upon the age and what you're trying to teach. Um, I know incentives, I, one of the greatest ones that I did, that I did not have as a child, um, but I had, that I used in my teaching, were just, I, I don't know if this answers your question, stickers, you know, or drawing a smiley face, oh, or yes. using words of encouragement, or taking the group for some kind of walking trip to see something different. Um, that takes them out of their regular, out of the box of regular learning and gets them to think a little more or see different things that yes, we have this in our lives too. Does that answer your question? Yes, I, I, I thank you, Dr. Tillerman. I really do appreciate this and uh, it, it is helpful. I like the idea that you have uh, presented that the incentives should be it's specific. Uh, my challenge is, however, that if we are speaking about an adult learner, what kind of incentives you would suggest alternatively for working with adult, adults as against working with younger children? And I ask this question particularly because of my interest in uh, restorative uh, criminology. Um, It's very funny you should mention criminology. Um, wait a minute. Um, I happen to know someone who graduated, barely graduated high school. And since I was a friend of the families, we were together a lot and they knew that I was in education. And somehow he went for a bachelor's degree and he spoke no English. He spoke no English whatsoever. Um, um, he, he graduated with a bachelor's. He finished his master's. And now he is doing his doctorate in criminology. So this is very, fun, it's very interesting that you have to mention this. Uh, restorative criminology. I think this is a lot of verbal communication. I don't know. I would use a lot of verbal communication, um, possibly some kind of reading material that would be interesting to them, maybe in sports. I honestly don't know. It, you know, it's such a, that's such a big field, it would have to be a little bit more specific in order to maybe help you. I honestly don't know. Nonetheless, I, I must say that I really appreciate uh, the direction in which you you, you have taken me, okay. um, because I really accept that perhaps sports uh, can be used as a form of rejuvenating, recultivating, resocializing. Because I can see that there's a lot of learning and there's a lot of benefits associated with sports. Because what in order to, to, my understanding here is that if you, in order to be successful in a game of sports, you have to understand and appreciate the rules of the particular 
sport or game that you're playing. And I can see uh, the connection in terms of behavior change and, and, and getting positive outcomes from a rule following perspective. And the responsibility of working in a group. Yes. And the responsibility, of course, controlling emotions and everything else. Yes. It's, it's yes. different, yeah. Much yeah. appreciated. Much appreciated. My Thank pleasure. you. You're welcome. Somebody else? Hello? Hello? Yeah, I am Susan Clare. Hi, I Susan. want to appreciate Dr. Carol um, for this very holistic presentation of your legacy. Thank you. I, and uh, I came in when you were sharing something about the music. Uh, that was your much innate talent, but you, you let it leave. I can't. The, the connection, 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 Susan, the connection. Connection is it's not so good. Hello, Susan, you'll have to write your, write your comment and question in chat and we can read that. Oh yeah. Oh. Because your sound is breaking up. Uh, let's go to admin. 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 We can see you. We don't know your name. Admin. We can see you. Admin is Susan. No, I think at no. No. Admin, can, can you speak? We see your name as admin, but we don't know what your name is. Can you speak? Hello? 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 Can I, speak? I don't know why. Can I speak? Yes, please go ahead. I'm Rosalie. Hello? Yes, Hello? I hear you. Hello? Hello? I am Rosalie. Okay, I am Rosalie. Yes. I am from Central African Republic. And uh, I, I am a teacher. I want to ask one question. Yes. In my region, there is not a college and uh, the, the college is very far away. Uh, it is uh, 70 kilometers, it's very far away. And I use, I, I want to make my legacy of cheating and I built a college. But the problem is that the parents don't have money to pay the college fees. But I don't know how to do because we need the money to pay the teacher. And uh, it is a real, a real problem. What to do to resolve this problem? I hope to uh, Doctor of uh, Andragogy in uh, AEU. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, what can you do? Um, well, there's something that you could do is it's wait a minute, I'll write it in chat. You can barter. Barter for the lessons. You know what that means? You know what that means? To barter. That means, um, Let's say I have a student and I have students that don't have money. I'll say to them, I want you to create something for me. I want you to um, well, older students. Uh, let's start with college students. I would say to them, I need some errands done. I need someone to help me to do some work in the house or in the office or I don't know what. 
I will get you free lessons for a week or two weeks if you will do this for me. Do you understand? Hello, Carol. Yes. Uh, I am Subhadra. I did my master's at AIU. So you're talking about hiring people. You need to think of the consequences. I am from Canada. I'm just saying like, if somebody comes and work for you or even student, there are legal implications. Yes. If a person gets hurt, you have to consider all these things. That's true. That's yeah. true. Okay. I have to say, okay. but I'm talking- shoes. If somebody get hurt, get a, a back problem. So it's a huge implication. Right, okay. so we need to consider this as well before we say like using barter system. It depends, yes, but again, if you're talking about maybe one particular person is better in math and the other particular person is better in English, then one is helping the other. I don't know if this would be legal or illegal in the country. No, but we have to think of an individual, whatever, whichever country it is. Yes, like uh, we yes. have to consider, uh, um, like um, globally, we have to consider uh, we are we are taking somebody to do some work, right? He can't afford to pay, and we are doing a barter system. And if that person in, is injured, okay, we have yes, to pay the cost. But I'm not talking. So let's. So you know, it's a matter of what is allowed in your country. And this is something I'm not familiar with in, in, in the world. What is allowed in the country, but also it can be one educational course comparing to another educational course. It does not necessarily have to be physical work. It can be sitting and sharing the learning. Okay. Yeah, that, that's I, I totally agree, but I'm coming to what you just said previously. Yes, so then, I, I, I I take, then I'm taking back my words and yeah. that has to be what is According to the country, yeah, obviously, obviously. Sure, obviously. I, agree. I agree, but my my comment you. was well, what you said. That's why I I okay. Thank yeah. you, thank, thank you, you for that. Thank you for that. You're welcome, Dr. Tillman. I think we're going to come to the end here. We've gone over time. Yeah, we have. But we're gonna we're gonna take a break now, and during the break, we're going to have an open mic for people okay. to talk about different issues. So I want to thank you for your presentation, the legacy of teaching, the legacy of culture, the legacy of learning from our parents as role models, and then we take that along. Do you have anything more that you want to say before we, before we uh, conclude? Um, I think the only thing I would like to add is I feel very honored to be able to participate today. Um, and listening to other people speak and the questions has given me more thought. Um, and I really appreciate it. And if you do have questions, I have my email is on chat. I don't know what I can help, but thank you. And thank you, ARU, for being here. Thank you so much, Dr. Carol Tillman, for your presentation. Thank you.